If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Sounds like I have a very powerful voice this morning. (laughs) Galatians 4, we'll be starting in verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is And is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us in January. Even though it's cold, Lord, I thank you for the warmth that the sun brings. I thank you for the beauty that's present, even as death seems to hold our world in its grips, Father. Lord, I thank you for the privilege you've given us on this cold morning of being here to worship you, of gathering as your people, and as acknowledging through our very presence that you are worthy of our worship. Father, I pray that you would receive the praises that are sung, the prayers that are offered, the meditation of people's hearts as they give attention to your word. I pray your word would accomplish the purpose for which you would send it out. And you would set a guard over my lips, Father, that I would speak words that are faithful and true. And all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Wouldn't it be great if there were only one religion? No Buddhism, no Hinduism, no Shintoism, no New Age movement, no Muslims, no Mormons, no Jehovah's Witnesses, just Christians. Wouldn't it be great if there weren't all of this confusion, all of these different versions of truth in regard to the things of God? Then everybody would know that there was just one way to God, and then each person would simply have the choice of either accepting or rejecting that one way. As it is, there are many different religions or philosophies that claim to be ways to God, so that if you want to get to God, you have the added confusion of these alternatives, each claiming to be truth. So many in the Western world today have taken another tact when it comes to the search for truth. Since there are so many different religions, each of them expressions of the different times and cultures in which they arose, And since all of these religions have followers who seem to be decent people and who really seem to believe what they were raised to believe, then all religions must be equally valid as ways to God. We're all worshiping the same God, just in different ways. At least that's the way popular relativistic theology sees it. And that perspective sounds good, very enlightened and culturally sensitive until you actually hold the perspective 
up to scrutiny. If the differences in the world's religions were compatible differences, then that perspective that we're all worshiping the same God just in different ways could be true. For example, if I told you I knew a woman named Mary who had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and was about five feet, three inches tall, and you told me you knew a woman named Mary who worked at Target, had a husband named Mike, and was in her 30s, we could be talking about the same Mary, even though we described her differently. There's nothing about my description of Mary that's in conflict with your description of Mary. Mary could have long blonde hair and work at Target. She could have blue eyes and have a husband named Mike. She could be five feet, three inches tall and in her thirties. On the other hand, if you go on to tell me that the Mary you're talking about has short black hair, brown eyes, and is about five feet, 10 inches tall, or if I tell you that the Mary I'm talking about has never been married and is in her 60s, we have a problem. We can't be talking about the same Mary because the differences are incompatible. And those incompatible differences between the two Marys are the same kinds of differences we find in the different world religions. There are similarities. They all have a moral code that share some of the same values. They all have alleged holy writings. They all have worship practices and places in which those worship practices take place. But when it comes to the primary distinctives of the religions, their concepts of God or the divine, their view of human beings in relation to the divine, their understanding of what lies beyond this life, how relationship with the divine is attained and exactly what that relationship means, in those areas that are the most important, the religions are not compatible. In fact, they're contradictory. So we can't hold on to that convenient cliche that we all must be worshiping the same God just in different ways, which means we have a problem. Which alleged truth is truth? It's as though God has involved us in some cosmic shell game. And if there isn't a P under every shell, if all religions are not equally valid as ways to God, then we have to guess as to which religion truly is the way to God. Or is there an alternative to simply having to close our eyes and guess? Is there something that sets truth apart? Something that sets Christianity apart? Something that would enable the honest searcher for truth to discover God's truth among all the differing truth claims in the world? And of course, it is this alternative that the Bible teaches. That there are a number of distinctives that set Christianity apart from the other religions of the world. The obvious one being that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God and the only way to God. No other religion of the world teaches that, either about Jesus or about that religion's founder. And if that truth claim is accurate, then that truth claim alone means that in Christianity we have found truth. There are other distinctives in Christianity, namely related to the nature of God. Christianity teaches, based on biblical revelation, that God is a triune being, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The other religions of the world either teach that God is a solitary being, in which case, by the way, he then is not an all-sufficient being because he needs something. He needs to create in order to have relationships. Or the religions teach that there are many gods and goddesses, or that there is no personal God at all, just some form or cosmic mind that exists out there in the universe. Then there's a third distinctive in Christianity. And this is the one the Apostle Paul is dealing with in the passage we opened up with this morning. Something unique about Christianity, something at the very heart of the Christian message that sets Christianity apart 
from every other religion that has ever existed or that exists today in the world. Look in Galatians 4 verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? The Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatian church in order to answer one basic question. Was Jesus' sacrifice on the cross sufficient to pay for all of our sins for all of time? Or is there something else that we have to do if we are to truly attain or keep salvation? Put more simply, is salvation a gift of God appropriated through faith alone? Or is salvation a mixture of faith and works? The Apostle Paul doesn't see the question as merely incidental to Christianity. He sees it as striking at the very heart of the Christian message. And so you find more impassioned language in this letter than in any of Paul's other letters. In fact, he starts off in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. You see, here's what was happening. Paul was going out into the world with the message of Jesus. With the message that it was only through faith in Jesus, the sacrifice he'd given on the cross, his victorious resurrection, his ascension now to the right hand of the Father, only through faith in Jesus that one could be saved. This salvation was a free gift of God, not something we could earn. It was not based on having made ourselves worthy of God. It was based simply on what God had done for us in Christ. People would accept that message, trust in Jesus as their Savior, a church would be established, and then Paul would move on to another place to share the gospel again. But then after he left the church that had been established, false teachers would come from Jerusalem. And they would say to these new Christians, well, it's really good that you believe in Jesus as Messiah, but now there are some other things you need to do if you're going to truly be saved or stay saved. And so they were bringing in the same works theology that had been a part of Judaism. You need to obey the Ten Commandments. You need to keep Jewish dietary laws. You need to be circumcised if you're male. And this infuriated the Apostle Paul. Because he had lived his whole life attempting to measure up to God's standards. He knew how impossible that was. He knew the self-righteousness that it brought and the emptiness that he'd felt. Writing to the Philippian church, the Apostle Paul tells us in speaking of the righteousness he had under the law. He tells us in Philippians 3 beginning in verse 5 that he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, those who were the most strict in trying to keep the law. Concerning zeal, he even persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, the checklist they gave him, he could check off the list. But what things were gained to me, he goes on to write, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith. 
When I stand before God, Paul's saying, I don't want to stand there based on my own righteousness because if I do, I won't be accepted. My only hope is to stand there clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, clothed in a perfect righteousness. That's my hope. So the Christian message wasn't like the message of the other religions of the world. All of those religions with their moral principles and their religious observances and their ways of trying to make yourself good enough for God, whether it was the Judaism out of which Paul had come or the Zoroasterism of the Babylonians or the religions of the Egyptians or the Greeks or the Romans, they all shared this common trait of trying to make human beings good enough for God, of trying to achieve or merit salvation. And that was not the Christian message. Amen. The Christian message wasn't just another variation of how man can work his way to God. The gospel was liberation from that message. That's why it was good news. The gospel was the message that God had done for man what man could not do for himself. That God was offering man salvation, not based on man's having earned it, but simply based on God's free gift. And so when the Apostle Paul heard what these false teachers were teaching, he knew that the very heart of the Christian message was being challenged. O oh, foolish Galatians, Paul writes in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 1, Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? And then in chapter 4, verse 21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? You see, if you're trying to earn your salvation or keep your salvation through the life you're living, then the standard you have to meet is sinless perfection. The standard is not being basically a good person. The standard is not never having committed big sins like murder or stealing or adultery. The standard is not even being a person who's only sinned one time in his life. If you're trying to get to a holy and a righteous God, either before you're a Christian or after you're a Christian through your own efforts, the standard is that your life must be sinlessly perfect. You can never have sinned in thought, word, or deed from the time you were born until the time you die. That's why Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law, as many are, as, who are trying to make themselves good enough for God, are under the curse... And here's the reason. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. There's the standard. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? Don't you recognize that the standard is unattainable? That you cannot make yourself good enough for God and that you're no more going to be able to keep your salvation than you were able to earn it to begin with. Before you're a Christian, you have to trust in what Jesus did for you in order to be accepted by God. And after you're a Christian, you still have to trust in what Jesus did for you in order to be accepted by God. You cannot lose your salvation because it isn't based on what you have done. It's based on the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice as payment for our sin and the sufficiency of Jesus' perfect righteousness, which we have been given. Well, yeah, I know it's not based on what I've done, you may say. I know it's based on God's grace. But I still believe you can lose your salvation if you don't do the things you're supposed to. 
Look in Romans chapter 11, verse 6. In speaking about the fact that our salvation is based on God's grace, Paul writes there, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Paul's saying we can either be saved through God's free gift or we can be saved because we've earned it. But both can't be true. It's either a gift or we've earned it. If it's a gift, but I have to give you something for it, it's not a gift. And if I have to give you something for it, then I'm in a sense buying it from you or earning it. Now, I know that one of the things that a lot of TV evangelists will do today is they'll, at the end of one of their programs, tell you they're going to, for a donation of $50, give you a free Bible. <laughs> it's not a free Bible. <laughs> You're paying $50 to get it. Amen. And that's the point that Paul's making here. Either our salvation is based on God's free gift. We have done nothing to deserve it or earn it. Or it's based on our having done enough to earn it. And the problem with the second option is it's unattainable. Because we're dealing with a perfectly righteous God. That's the standard. One to which no human being can live up. So in order to make this same point to the Galatians, Paul gives us an analogy. Go back to Galatians 4, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Paul's referring here to the fact that Abraham had two children, one Ishmael, who was born the natural way. Abraham had sex with a woman who was still fertile and she conceived. The other child, Isaac, was born as a result of divine intervention. Abraham was 99 years old when Isaac was conceived, and his wife, Sarah, was 90. Now, maybe you could see a 99-year-old man still being able to father a child, but for a 90-year-old woman to conceive and give birth when her womb had been dead for four decades, that required divine intervention. That required God doing for Abraham and Sarah what they could not do for themselves. Verse 23, But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Now let me show you what Paul means when he refers to Isaac's having been born as a result of a promise. Go to Genesis 17, verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He says, God, I already have a son through my wife's handmaid, Hagar. Let the promise come through him. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I've blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. And then go to Genesis 21. Verse 1. 
And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Okay, now go back to Galatians 4 and look at what Paul says next. Verse 24, which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. He's speaking there of Judaism. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who, do not, who, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. These two children of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, are symbolic of the two covenants. Ishmael is symbolic of the covenant of works, the Ten Commandments, and all that obedience to those commandments require. The new covenant established by Christ, established on the basis of God's promise, is exemplified in Isaac. Then look at what Paul says next in verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. In other words, we didn't become God's children because we lived up to the law. It wasn't through having earned salvation that we were saved. It was through God's promise. Through the supernatural birth that only God can produce. Romans 10, 9 tells us, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then Paul presses his analogy even further. Verse 29 but as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. There are those within Christianity who want to make Christianity just another way of man trying to work his way to God. Jesus becomes just a centerpiece for a religion of works. And then those same people ridicule those who point out that there's no way a human being could ever work his way to God. That only faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us can save us. They say things like, what well, does that mean you could still murder someone and still be a Christian? What about those people who start off as Christians and then later deny him? They try to belittle this glorious truth that God has done for us what we could not do for ourselves so look at what Paul says about those who would deny that our salvation is secure in Christ. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. If you're trying to get to God based on making yourself good enough, you're in a heap of trouble because you won't be accepted. You'll stand before God and he'll say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. Paul tells us in Galatians 2.16, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Galatians 4.31 goes on then. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We're not saved because we have merited or earned our salvation. We're saved because God has given it to us in response to the faith that we've placed in Jesus Christ. In the work that he did. In the salvation he secured for us. And our salvation, secured through Jesus' sacrifice and appropriated by faith, is absolutely secure. 
So the look what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present in your life right now, nor things to come, things that will happen in your life in the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. That includes even you, doesn't it? You're a created thing. So not even you can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our faith is secure because of Jesus. He paid the price for all of our sins. And we stand before God now clothed, not in our own righteousness, which is according to the law and which we don't have but clothed in the righteousness which God has given us through faith. Let's pray. If you think there's something that you have to do to earn your salvation. If you think there's something you have to do to keep it, you haven't understood the gospel. You've not understood the message of Christianity. Because the message of Christianity is you can't do it. You can't be good enough to achieve salvation and you can't be good enough to keep it. You're always going to have to depend on what God has done for you. You're always going to have to depend on Jesus, on His righteousness, on the sufficiency of His sacrifice. And so I want you to thank God for Jesus. Had Jesus never come, no human being would have been accepted by God. There is salvation in no other name, the scriptures tell us. And this is the gospel that we carry to people. To people out there in the world who are trying to make themselves good enough. People caught in bondage to their sin. People trying to make heaven for themselves down here and always failing. And to those people who are struggling, who are laboring and heavy laden, we bring a gospel, good news. You can stop the struggling because God has given you salvation through what Jesus did. Through your faith in Jesus' sacrifice, you can be made pure. You can be made holy before a holy God. He has taken your condemnation. He has given you His righteousness. If you're a believer here this morning, I want you to spend some time thanking God for that. Thanking God for Jesus 
and asking you to always remember that you have to be dependent on Him, always dependent on Him. Maybe you're also with us today and you haven't yet trusted in Jesus Christ. Maybe you're one of those who thinks you're good enough just the way you are. You don't need a Savior. Or maybe you're caught up in trying to make yourself good enough. You've got this checklist you're trying to live up to to make sure you do everything right. You're never going to be able to keep the checklist. But you have a God who loves you. Even when we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that God who loves you has made a way for you to be saved. Not based on your personal righteousness, not based on you being good enough, but based on Jesus being good enough. Jesus can be your substitute. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you, you will be saved. And so if you're with us this morning and you understand that you've sinned, you understand that one day you will stand before a holy God. There is a way to be cleansed of your sin. There's a way to be accepted by that holy God. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. And so if you know that you've sinned and you want the forgiveness that only comes through Jesus, the promise of eternal life that only comes through Jesus, if you would raise your hand, I will lead you in a prayer of commitment. I'll pray the words aloud. You can repeat them silently to God right where you are. All you need to do is raise your hand. Father God, I thank you for the matchless work of your Son. I thank you, Father, for the abundance of your love. I thank you, Father, for reaching out to us in the midst of our sin to make us clean, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, Lord. I thank you, Father, that God the Son came among us as one of us. That he was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. I thank you that he gave his life as the spotless lamb in sacrifice. A sacrifice that was acceptable to you whose acceptance is proven because death, the punishment for sin, could not hold him. Jesus arose from the dead on the third day, victor over death and hell and sin. I thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation that comes through Jesus. That we can find rest from our labors. I thank you, Father, for the promise we have of forever with you and for the privilege you've given us of going out into this sin-drenched world with the message of a Savior, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us be faithful, Lord. 
All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.